So, folks, thanks for having me tonight. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, as a beginning here, I'm going to bet you all just heard about lots of problems with the ARL. You know, Tom and I have been in the same meetings in a lot of places, and I kind of heard each other's stories. So, um, And, uh, you know, the problems that Tom brought out are real problems. There's no question about it. But I'll also bet you heard very well few real solutions to those problems. Can you think of one? I bet you can't. What, well, I'd like, what I'd like to talk about tonight is what we're actually doing to solve some of these problems and also to clear some things up. You know, it's hard when you're one step removed from the board to really understand sometimes what's actually going on. And so I'm also going to try to help with that a little bit. All right. Can you guys see this okay? I'm not sure what you got there. Can you read yeah, it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The number one issue that I think the ARL and that, for that matter, amateur radio faces is we need to get new people of all ages involved in amateur radio and get them active and on the air. If we cannot do that, then almost anything else that we want to accomplish is going to be almost impossible. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of, of this situation, based on a lot of work that's been done at the ARRL in the last um, two or three years to understand this, we believe the average age of a licensed ham in the United States is just a little bit north of 75 years old. And that's actually not the most serious issue we face. Um, the most serious issue I think we face is getting new hams that get licensed to active and on the air. If we license 10 new people to technician tonight, we'll be lucky if more than two or three of them are active after a year and the rest will be gone. And so after a lot of work on all kinds of committees, work groups, um, and so on in the board, what I think many of us have concluded is, is that we have to focus on bringing new people to amateur radio first. Now, I've been involved in a lot of work collaboratively on probably three or four different work groups where we've had a number of directors, we've had people from headquarters, we've had board officers in some cases involved in those things to try to come up with effective programs and some policy changes for the league that will actually help with this. And this is not everything that I've been involved in, but these are some of the more important things. So. In terms of board actions, um, some motions that, uh, that I've had the privilege to work on and, and contribute significantly to are programs to support licensing, um, development that clubs and, and others can use to help people get licensed, boot camps to help people get on the air, programs to create live interactive training in the work center, some of which is being done. Um, promotion of uh, and training of techs to utilize their 10 meter and six meter privileges to get started on HF like activities. Um, many hams can't afford to get it to put a station up, or in some cases they can't even um, they can't even put antennas up. And so we've also put together programs that headquarters is working on implementing to promote remote stations, help hams figure out how to build them, help clubs figure out how to get them deployed. And uh, lastly, we know from some of the survey work that the ARL has done that particularly for young families, let's say 30 somethings that have kids maybe in middle school or high school that get licensed, they find themselves in a situation where both parents work, they have very limited time and very limited money, and it becomes a big barrier for these folks to get stations together. So there's also work going on on programs to help those hams figure out how to get started in amateur radio with simple low costs and, and low time commitments now all of this work was passed unanimously by the board and that was a result of the fact of two things first of all many people worked on this there's some falsehoods i guess i'll call them out there that somehow these things were all created by me personally or something like that. that's simply not the case all of these motions were, were done by collaborative work groups, including people from headquarters, because if you want to actually get something implemented and you don't include those people, you might well as forget it. 
And uh, the other thing that I think is out there that's not correct is some notion that the board is not collaborating or behind these things or doesn't buy into them. And I would again tell you that that's not true. Every single thing you're looking at here in terms of these motions was all passed unanimously by every single member on the board. And I would suggest to you that without the collaboration that was involved to create this stuff, we would not have directors unanimously voting to make them happen. Okay. Now, as far as implementing this stuff, a lot of the focusing because we acquired recently Gordon West licensing resources, and I was pretty heavily involved in making that acquisition happen. Gordon, if you, if you don't know, is one of the biggest proponents for licensing in amateur radio that there is. And in addition to uh, getting protecting his manuals and making sure they stay available now as ARL resources, we were also to, able to engage Gordon West to help us support all these initiatives, promote them, and get them off the ground. Most of the work on the motions has focused on getting Gordon West licensing materials, not only the books, but also the, the, the slides and so on that he provides to help people teach license classes up to date. Now, there are pretty limited resources at headquarters to work on some things, on, on things like this. And so it's going to take a little bit of time for the headquarters team to get all this done. But I know they're also out soliciting articles for the other three motions, the promotion for 10 and 6, the remote stations, and this last item as well. Um, another thing that I've had uh, the privilege to work on a bunch, well, along with a bunch of other people was the club grant program. Now, when I came on the board, the ARL had secured through the foundation a half a million dollars from ARDC with a direction to give it out to clubs. Um, my background in amateur radio has been building amateur radio clubs almost from the point that I became a ham. So I decided that it would make sense for me to get involved and try to help with this. And what we did is we set up a program to encourage clubs to focus on bringing new people to amateur radio, building remote stations, um, training hams through things like boot camps and, and other programs, and generally supporting some of the same um, items that we pass the motions for. And clubs are a very important kind of force multiplier to get all this done. That program was very successful. And as a result, um, working alongside of the folks at headquarters, um, I was able to help us secure another half a million dollars from ARDC. And the second round of this program is running right now, which will ultimately, by the time we get to the end of the year, have awarded a million dollars to clubs that want to help with this effort. Okay. Now, I don't think you can... Um, work on things like this unless you're actively involved in doing them. You know, getting new people in amateur radio is hard. We really struggled with this. And, and by the way, there's some implications out there that somehow all of our membership issues and new ham engagement and all has all happened in the last three or six years. Folks, these problems have been with us for a long, long time. And I think it's very interesting that some of the folks that are pointing out that we're not making the progress we need. We're directors in some cases for 30 years while all this stuff was in place and also didn't really move the needle in any significant way to solve these problems. So some of the things I've been involved in, I think have helped me contribute to the process. Um, we've been involved in doing license training and mentoring along with Gordon West. Um, he and I have been pretty close friends for a long time and we've used his system to license or upgrade over 480 hams. My wife and I and a bunch of very dedicated volunteers in our local club have done that work. We created a mentoring program called Ham Boot Camp, which has since served over a thousand hams, including some outside the United States. And that's one of the programs, if you remember the motion from the previous chart, that we're trying to get the ARL to promote and scale up on a bigger basis so that we can get other folks to benefit from it as well. Um, I'm also heavily involved in a program that helps schools make space station contacts with astronauts on the space station. And that's important because it gives me the opportunity to work firsthand with kids in schools and teachers and help them bring amateur radio into the classroom and, and learn how to do that. And that's going to be very, very important in the long run for the ARL as it continues to build out its capability to do that. Now, the other thing I think you probably heard about is regulatory stuff. 
and you probably saw a long list of things and a claim that the arrow isn't making any progress. Well, that's also not true. So let's look at what's really happening for a second. And by the way, before we dive into this, um, there's only one person in this race that's actually worked with the FCC to make policy. I was a, a, a member of something called the FCC's Technical Advisory Committee for two years where we worked right alongside of the FCC to help them develop policy based upon um, interference issues, voice over IP, next generation cellular networks and other things. And that gave me quite a bit of insight into how to actually get things done and how things work at the FCC. So here's the real story on what's going on in these motions. First of all, um, we've gotten the symbol rate um, proposal for the HF bands that eliminates that restriction approved. Based on our work and the FCC's views, the FCC initiated a future notice of proposed rulemaking to do the same thing on the VHF bands. And after a suitable counter uh, comment period, that will become done as well. Um, there's a couple things here that we should be happy they didn't get done because if they had, they'd have cost us band privileges, particularly the 900 megahertz filing that recently came out from NextNav would totally reallocate and basically take our 900 megahertz band away. And also the proceeding this summer from the shortwave modernization coalition, which would have allowed a lot of very uh, destructive interference to occur with our HF bands. The ARL successfully filed comments and uh, I had a hand along with other directors in marshalling our own members to comment on these proposals. And we both got them stopped in their tracks. For these two, success is stopping them in their tracks. We really weren't looking to get anything passed here. And uh, not really sure what the implication was that we should be. On the 60 meter proposal, um, the big thing we need to do here is make sure the FCC goes far enough to not only adopt the WRC 2015 agreements, which would remove some of the channel restrictions on this band, but also preserve our, our 100 watt channelized allocation so that we can use it effectively for MCOM and other things. Now, the last thing I wanna mention here is the tech enhancement. Um, Tom, I think justifiably is very proud of the role that he played in helping to create this. But again, we dropped the ball when it came to execution. What happened with the tech modernization is, is that the board members involved in creating this and were on the board at the time did not do the important work to explain it properly to HAMS, um, both that were ARL members and to HAMS in general. And as a result, what happened? HAMS filed tons of negative comments on this proposal and killed it. So we, the amateur radio community, because of lack of attention from the appropriate um, folks in the league, including the people that created the tech proposal, got it killed. Now, I've been working very closely with David Sadal, our FCC attorney, to do two things since I've been in office. One is to make sure that when we file comments, like on these proposals in orange here at the top, the, the commercial attacks and so on, that we provide good support for hams that want to file comments. So they understand what the issues are and, and have some guidelines or guidance on how to file comments if they want to do that. And that's really important. Without the comments, you can't get anything done in these NPRM, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking Proposals. On the tech stuff, I've been working with David um, since I became a director to get this thing elevated to the point where we can bring it back around again. It will come back around as one of the highest priority things that the ARL is working probably early next year. And David and I are discussing a plan whereby we will put together a script and engage the rest of the board and ARL communications resources to make sure we explain this properly to HAMS this time so it actually gets passed. There's also a couple other things here that Tom probably mentioned that are gonna be bundled along with the tech modernization. They're not anywhere near the importance of what that is, but they will probably go along for the ride and get passed too. Now, lastly, our bands are under siege, especially the bands above the UHF spectrum above because they're very useful for satellite services and terrestrial wireless. Um, one of the things I'm very proud to have initiated here in New England is a focus on deploying something called Arda networks um, across the division. Now, there's quite a few folks that were working on these things already 
But what we've done is um, through one of my assistant directors, Rob Lydon, put together a program to promote these networks and link them together. And the reason that's important, not only for the fact that now our repeaters are linked with RF and not the internet, which gives us a much more um, reliable MCOM platform in emergencies. But more importantly, did you know that the FCC engages commercial satellite providers to look down and measure the utilization of bands through satellites in space? And they take that data into account when we make claims that the bands that we have are used and should be maintained. Guess what? Arden, when they look down in New England, is going to light up continuously 24-7 the 5 gigahertz band, which is commercially the most one of the most valuable bands that amateur radio has. And so in addition to just passing motions and hoping that the FCC does something, you need uh, someone um, uh, that can work with the folks that um, file our comments, particularly David Siddall and the rest of the board, to make sure that we lobby properly and make sure that we have a chance of winning these fights when we have to get involved in them. Now, as far as trying to solve problems for people in the division. I, I mentioned the art and work, but there's another area that I heard an awful lot about, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this. We struggle constantly with RF interference issues. Some of them are caused by um, solar equipment. Some of them by power line systems, particularly above ground that are aging and damaged. Um, sometimes it's caused by things in our homes. So based upon that feedback from our members, and it was a lot of it three years ago when I first got this job. Um, I got someone, um, an assistant director appointed, his name is Rob Lydon, K1UI. Um, we lined up with the folks inside the board that um, are worrying about this stuff to create a pilot program here in New England. Rob went out and got a grant from ARDC for a little over $23,000 lined up 50 volunteers all across the division, trained them, equipped them with RF direction finding equipment and set up a pro process so that any ham that has an interference problem can get help and get it resolved. We work closely with the folks at the ARL lab to develop this program and uh, with the folks on the RFI committee of the board to make sure that we were in lockstep with what they're doing. And they are looking very closely as we make this program work of trying to encourage other divisions to replicate it and make it a full out ARL program in the long run to solve this problem. Um, anybody here involved in the national traffic system? And you guys, hopefully, I'm sure you all know what it is. It basically is one of the things that the ARL was founded on. And there's an awful lot of hams in New England who do traffic handling. It's probably one of the strongest um, 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 public service efforts in this area in the United States. Based again upon um, requests from a lot of really fine, dedicated people here in New England, um, um, I was able to work with the Emergency Communications and Field Services Committee, even though I'm not a member of that committee, and get a program established to revitalize ARL support for the national traffic system. We've been working on this for two and a half years. It's all volunteer driven. All of the changes and enhancements that we've done have all been bottoms up by people who do traffic on a collaborative basis. Several of our section managers are involved in helping promote this and are behind it very strongly. And uh, we pretty much brought the NTS system, the national traffic system and aerial support to it for it back to life. We built modern training. We've got a new letter that comes out every month, similar to the ones for Aries. We're working on reliability, performance, and coverage, and a whole bunch of other things. Again, an example of taking feedback from folks that care about an issue here in the division and actually making something happen to get their concerns and needs addressed in a way that moves the air all forward. All right. Now, a couple last things. Mitch, how am I doing on time? How much have I got left? Three minutes left. Three minutes. Oh, my goodness. All right. So um, I didn't have the opportunity to see the pre preceding talk, but I did see it in other settings. And there's a few things that were said there that I'd like to address. So first of all, there was a suggestion that I somehow lead a, um, what was it called, an exclusive caucus of directors 
that uh, that um, somehow don't collaborate. Well, a couple things I want to point out to you there. Um, the history was that about the second board meeting, well, first of all, for the record, I do not lead that caucus. As a matter of fact, I didn't even attend it for the first six months of the year. So that statement is absolutely flat false. Yes, I have been involved in it. Yes, I'm currently involved in it. That part is true. That got created because we had a couple board meetings where the board did so little that several of us were actually kind of ashamed of spending multiple tens of thousand dollars to pass a few club recognitions and shuffle around the rules for certain committees and go home. That's not acceptable. We have so many problems and you know we've done a lot of work to point them all out. It seemed to many of us, and I would say all but three or four people on the board are involved in this, pretty regular basis, decided that it was time for us to do better. And they got together and they found a set of issues that they felt were important. By the way, many of those were those motions that were passed unanimously by the rest of the board. When, and there's when, no there's no intent to exclude anybody there, so except that you have. Minute. I'm sorry, Mitch. One minute, please. Finish I up. got it. I heard it. Um, except that you have to be willing to work with the rest of the group constructively, and most board members do that just fine. Some seem to not be able to do that for reasons that, quite frankly, baffle the hell out of the rest of us. Okay. The other thing I want to mention briefly is the dues increase. Um, the ARL would have lost over $2 million this year. It lost almost $2 million last year, and it lost almost a million the year before. We did a survey, which, by the way, I did not design. Headquarters designed the survey, and it was in place long before the work to figure out what to do here happened. And we learned two things. 40% of our members said that they were happy with digital um, QST and didn't want to have to pay more dues to keep getting print. And we also got very strong feedback that if we went over $59 of dues, there was going to be a complete train wreck. Brad, that's, that's time. Okay. All right. Got it. If you guys want to add, get, get the rest of the story, just somebody asked me a question. I need about another 30 seconds to finish it. We will. Uh, I'll ask a question on, uh, on uh, you know, well, typically Ada where all tends to uh, do things like roll their own. I mean, you had a couple of programs there that you had listed that, you know, we're, we're, we're instituting and uh, trying to follow up on, but there's a lot of organic uh, stuff out there today, especially, for example, uh, Parks on the Air, super popular. Yep. A lot of people involved, and you know, it built up organically. It wasn't kind of a forced on thing. You know, uh, with that popularity, how do you see? And just as that as an example, how do you see AWRL? You know, dovetailing in and collaborating with with events and groups like that in order to help expand amateur radio, rather than you know do things independently. I think that's a great question. Um, I I am a big advocate for bottoms up program development. Remember that those comments that I made about the national traffic system? Mm -hmm. That was all done by people on the ground who do traffic. The only standing ob um, objective I had there was we don't involve the board till we know what we want to do. And we make sure that the board supports the work and that we're aligned with basic things that the ARL is trying to do. We're not going off and try to create a different organization or something. I believe that program is a prototype for lots of stuff, including the kinds of things that you're worried about, POTAs. I think we could solve many of our areas of growth issues with that same kind of approach. I think a lot of the club programs should be done that way. There's no substitute for having the people that are involved in doing something come up with the programs. That's how you get them right the first time instead of deploying things and making mistakes over and over till you finally listen to the right people and get it right. So I am absolutely a proponent for having volunteers do the work. I do think that headquarters and the board needs to play a role that I kind of call guardrails. We have to make sure that the things we do are scalable, supportable in the long run, because sometimes those volunteers don't stay with it forever. And the ARL has to take those programs forward or find new volunteers or whatever. And there are certain things that we need in terms of documentation, other things sometimes in order to do that. But I am absolutely 100%. And by the way, think about this. Imagine how much the ARL could accomplish in implementing some of the things I talked about if instead of having to only do those with people at headquarters, we could engage volunteers on each and every one of them. Go pretty quick, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, it could. And I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more of a, you know, how do you, because it's already there, it's already volunteered, it's already built. Yeah. How does it, how does, you know, you talked about, uh, 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 oh my gosh, and you're doing the, uh, uh, the RFI stuff, the interference stuff you're talking about? I'm talking about it right at the beginning where we have, uh, what's his name, who, who does all the uh, um, Gordon West. Amateur Radio. Gordon West. Gordon yeah. West. Yeah. yeah, Gordon West stuff. incorporated Gordon West into ARRL, right? So it became a, it became a program of ARRL. I'm Correct. Yoga and other things where it doesn't get, you know, brought into the ARRL umbrella, but how does the ARRL cooperate with something like that? I mean, that's something to think about. I know Mitch has a question he'd like to ask. Yeah. No, I, these, are good, these are good suggestions. Look, there, there aren't anywhere near enough people at headquarters at the ARRL to do much of anything by ourselves. I think mm -hmm. we need to get in the business of engaging partners and volunteers and stuff to do things. Otherwise, we're just not going to get it done. Yeah. So I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. The thing you were talking about a minute ago that you weren't a part of for the first six months of the year, was that the shadow board? There is no shadow board. For there to be a shadow board, you'd have to have a subset of the board that could act, and that does not exist, Paul. Okay, what, Look, was, Mike, what was Mike talking about, K1TWF? I, I have no idea. Honestly, I don't. What, well, here's we, what I can tell you is, let me tell you what's really going on there. That's what actually matters, Okay. What happens when that group gets together, and by the way, everybody that's willing to collaborate is welcome, is each person that's involved, each director brings a set of things that they think they would like to see get done. Okay. And the group um, talks about them. Sometimes they force some uh, working groups to go off and try to develop a proposal or a policy that would accomplish what that director wants. Sometimes the group looks at those things and they say, you know what, maybe not right now, or maybe there's already an existing committee or somewhere that should be handling that. So some things end up, you know, getting discussed and sent somewhere else. When the group decides to work on something, a lot of good energy goes in, a lot of collaboration, trying to take the best ideas, make sure that the concerns are going to work. We usually will talk to people at headquarters to make sure that what we want to do is executable by them. And at the end of the day, somebody writes a motion. And um, for, that, for the most part, many of those things get passed unanimously by the board because they're well formulated and thought out and they're good policy. Part of the problem of not having something like a caucus is you go to a board meeting and somebody tries to spend 45 minutes on an important issue and create policy. And you know what? You get one of two things when you do that. You get a very shallow answer that doesn't really do much or you get bad policy. And so without collaboration and people working together, the the board is simply not going to be able to do good work. You want to call that kind of thing a shadow board? Sure, I guess you could. But what I think really matters is what that group is getting done. Look at the motions that have been getting passed. Look closely and ask yourself, you know, some of the stuff I listed, does that look like things that might help amateur radio? I think they will. Fred, I, I've asked this of Tom, and, and I know we've we've talked about this. He talked about it. You talked about it. There's a lot of discouraging news being reported about the ARL this year, which is yeah. leaving the membership in doubt. And, and that's the thing, in doubt about the ability of its leadership. Three excellent candidates in three of the five director races were disqualified over what is determined by many voters, what we perceive to be dubious reasons. This affects us directly because one of the disqualified candidates was from our very own New England division. Yep. And we talk about Mike Raisbeck. Uh, he, he was on the board for 27 years, uh, vice director, uh, a vice president. Uh, he talked about the shadow board. He also talked about uh, more board transparency, which this is a problem, certainly. And a call to restructure the same very, the very same ethics and election committee yep. who was just recently disqualified candidates finally as details of the data breach which still affects the league becomes known it's been learned that there have been questionable it practices i certainly question them they were in play and to this day there's still not a clear and concise direction amongst everyone to resolve all the many it issues so right. in light of this information what steps will you specifically take to resolve these problems whether they be real or perceived, 
and build back trust and faith in the ARO, which I think is ser seriously lacking right now. I, I, by the way, I couldn't agree with your, your premise more, Mitch. Um, we have self-inflicted tremendous damage on this organization. Now, let me start. You, get, you put up quite a bit of stuff out there, so I'm going to try to unpack it one at a time and help me if I miss anything, okay? Let's talk about the E&E &E thing first. I have um, since, actually late last year, I have been blocking a path forward that's kind of what I'll call a halfway improvement on E&E. &E. Now, here's the thing. The rules that E&E &E tries to enforce are not well written. They're not necessarily grounded in good standards for practice and, and for nonprofits and common law. And here's the real issue. If God themselves were a director and they were on E&E &E and enforced the rules, people would question whether it was done honestly. And so what's the message here? We need to get the board the hell out of this process completely. Yes, we need ethical standards. And I actually think that having truthful um, standards for candidates, assuming that are applied properly, and I would admit that there are questions about whether it's been applied properly, are necessary. I've also seen situations where directors have definitely crossed lines, and because of lack of good standards, nothing could be done. Things like people roughing up other employees. Um, one instance where a one director... Um, 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 kind of, well, sort of attacked in an inappropriate way another director. And so those kinds of behavior have no place in any organization, okay? So we need standards for ethical behavior, and we need to be able to deal with situations where people cross lines. I think what needs to be done is very simple. We need to point an outside independent expert that's completely independent, including historically from the board. Someone that has no ax to grind, someone who's professional at handling, setting standards for this kind of work and for properly prosecuting or, or adjudicating or however you want to think of that claims of ethics breaches when they come up. Um, I also think that we need a very light committee on the inside that when somebody makes a claim, they take a quick look at it. And as soon as they find that there might anything be there, it should be passed to the outside expert. And that outside expert should be the one that's helping us write the rules so that they're written in a way that they're clear, enforceable, and they meet best practices for organizations like ours. If and when we do that, I will stop blocking progress on this issue. And by the way, it takes three quarters of the board to do it. But to date, and I will 100%, you've got a recording, you have me on record. I will not allow any modernization, at least not vote for any modernization of any &E that doesn't meet what I just said. Because as long as we leave it the way it is, we're going to continue to do things that are going to, whether they're right or wrong, are going to drag the arrow through the mud and undermine the trust of our members. Now, on the, on the IT situation. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, no, we finish the Q&A, so. Uh, okay, you got it. All right, so ahead. real briefly on the IT issue. Part of the reason the communications were limited there is because we brought in professional people to help us negotiate this, and they told us not to communicate. Also, law enforcement told us not to communicate for a variety of good reasons. And... Um, what I'd also say is relative to the IT situation, again, I believe that what we need to do, and you and I talked about this, Mitch, we need to outsource the day-to-day -day operations of IT. We are never going to be able to hire a big enough IT staff for Newington to ever do all those things we want to do ourselves. It's just not possible. Qualified IT people are probably not waiting in line to go to work for the ARL in Newington. Sorry, but that's the truth. So we should outsource as much as we can. And we should maintain, possibly with support of volunteers in some cases, IT specialists that can do important applications that are unique to us, like the website, logbook of the world, the new DXCC system, a better learning platform that's interactive, the stuff that we really need that's unique to us. We have a chance at pulling that off, I think. The cyber attack, I've been advocating for this for a while. I think the cyber attack woke up a lot of people that this might be the right way to go. And um, I'm anxious to keep pressing on that charge. But at any rate, that's the path I want to take on that one. Fred, if you will, in the chat, put your email and phone number so people have any questions.
questions, they can easily reach him. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very, uh, very worthwhile evening for all of us. All right. Um, by the way, I think you, I get to make a closing statement here. So can I get, can I do that still, Mitch? Quick, quick. <laughs> Quickly. Got yeah, it. Yes, yes, all right. <laughs> so, so, so folks, um, it's pretty easy to just point out problems, but what this board needs are directors, not just one, that we're actually going to solve them. And it's a lot more work to solve the problems than it is to just point them out. It takes collaboration. It takes tremendous time. For me, it's six days a week. And it also takes um, patience and someone who can work not only in the board, but inside headquarters to actually get people to come along and do things. I want nothing more than to continue to do this work. I've worked as hard as I know how. And lastly, I would say we both have records. If you have any doubt about what I'm saying in terms of progress, look at my record and look at the other guy's record. It's three years versus 30. And I think you'll see where the difference is. So I hope you'll support me with your vote and I'll continue to work as hard as I can for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.